Throughout its history, China had always been regarded as a major superpower. In their sphere of influence, it was always hard, often impossible, to oppose the will of Chinese emperors. Throughout its 4,000-year existence, China was repeatedly a beacon of progress, where science and education brought forth things like gunpowder, papermaking, printing or the compass. But by the 19th century, Chinese power was beginning to crumble. Technologically, they were lagging behind Western powers, who aggressively expanded their influence throughout the world. Soon, China would experience Western imperialism. Friction between them led to not one, but two conflicts, now famously known as the Opium Wars. In 1557, the Portuguese were the first to establish direct maritime trade between Europe and China. Throughout the following centuries, trading with China was extremely lucrative, as demand in Europe for Chinese goods like tea, porcelain and silk was at an all-time high. But there was a problem. The imperial government of China mandated that their goods could only be exported in exchange for silver. The recent conquests in South America did bring in lots of silver for the Europeans, but most of it was sent to China. Furthermore, trading with China was very difficult. Only a few select ports could be used by European ships, trade occurred only through intermediaries called Kohongs, and foreigners weren't allowed to learn Chinese. Tensions were mounting up since there now was a huge trade deficit between Europe and China. In the late 18th century, though, things changed. The British East India Company expanded its cultivation of opium in India and began selling it to private Chinese traders and smugglers. They realized that they could use this drug to drastically reduce trade deficit. By 1797, 4,000 chests of opium each weighing 77 kilograms, were being sent to China every year, in exchange for silver. Opium was always known as a medicinal ingredient, but the recreational usage of this drug was limited. Until now, that is. Initially, China tolerated this trade as this increased the supply of silver for Europeans, which meant they could spend more money in China. However, using opium for recreation had one big side effect. It's addictive. Members of every class of society were beginning to feel the effects of opium addiction and societal stability was now under threat. Those who tried to stop consuming were experiencing withdrawal symptoms, nausea, chills, cramps and sometimes even death. Those who didn't stop would do almost anything to get their hands on the drug. Consumption spread inland and the narcotics trade was extremely profitable both for Europeans and the Chinese smugglers and traders. By 1831, 20,000 chests of opium reached the shores of China every year. Less than a decade later, that number grew to 30,000. No matter what they tried, Chinese authorities couldn't stop opium from coming in. Relations between East and West were beginning to heat up. In 1839, Lin Zexu was appointed by the emperor to the post of Special Imperial Commissioner with the task of eradicating the opium trade. Lin banned the sale of opium, closed the Pearl River Channel where British traitors were anchored, seized all opium stockpiles and boarded British ships to destroy all opium on board. In response, British Superintendent of Trade with China, Charles Elliot, ordered all ships carrying opium to flee and prepare for battle. But the sailors were besieged in the foreign quarter of Canton and kept from communicating with their ships. To defuse the situation, Elliot convinced them to give up their opium with the controversial promise that the British government would eventually compensate them. From now on, things would rapidly escalate and in early November of that year, the first fires of the war were shot. The first battle of Chuenpi saw the HMS Volage and the HMS Hyacinth engaging a fleet of Chinese war junks. Four Chinese vessels sunk and both fleets retreated. In June 1840, the first part of a British expeditionary force arrived in China. They issued an ultimatum demanding the Qing government to pay compensation for losses suffered by the interruption of opium trade. This demand was, of course, rejected. The British then proceeded to launch a ground assault on the Chusan archipelago. They destroyed the Chinese ships and bombarded the port into submission. Next came Macau and many other conquests. The Royal Navy had superior ships and guns, and China faced one humiliating defeat after the other. 
For nearly three years, the Chinese and the British fought each other until finally the conflict ended with China's defeat. On August 29, 1842, the Treaty of Nanking was signed. The treaty forced China to pay compensation to Britain, seat Hong Kong as a colony, end limits on trade in Canton, allow free trade in four other ports, exempt foreigners from local laws, and grant Britain the status of most favored nation. This affair was a huge blow to the Qing dynasty and went down in history as the first of the unequal treaties. With the war over, trade resumed and life went on as if nothing happened. Yeah, not so much. The fragile peace sealed by the controversial Nanking Treaty lasted for only 14 years. In 1856, the new imperial commissioner, Ye Ming Chen, was in charge of stamping out the opium trade in Canton. Opium was still technically illegal. In October that year, he seized the Arrow, a British ship, and threw its crew into chains. The governor of British Hong Kong, Sir John Bowring, sent a fleet to Canton, which arrived on October 23rd and bombarded the Pearl River forts. He didn't have enough men to capture the city, so he bombed it instead. Riots broke out in the port and European properties were set on fire. French missionary Auguste Chapdelaine was executed in Guangxi and that prompted the French to join forces with the British. Together, they attacked and occupied Canton and maintained control over it for the next four years. The United States and Russia sent envoys to Hong Kong to offer military help. European powers were still seeking to obtain greater concessions from China. They wanted the legalization of opium trade, opening all of China to British merchants and exempting foreign imports from transit duties. Two years into the war, the treaties of Tianjin were signed. Britain, France, Russia and the US gained the right to open embassies in Beijing. Ten ports were open to foreign trade. All foreign vessels were now allowed to navigate on the Yangtze River. All foreigners had the right to travel freely in all of China. Plus monetary compensations, of course. Separately, Russia gained the left bank of the Amur River and later obtained land on the Pacific coast where they established the city of Vladivostok. However, this was not the end of the war. Since this treaty wasn't ratified, the Second Opium War actually continued. Now, 18,000 French soldiers captured Tianjin and 8,000 British and French troops were invading Beijing. The Chinese had 30,000 men who faced their enemies with swords, while the Western powers had guns. The defeat was unthinkable. 15,000 Chinese soldiers were dead or injured, while on the other side, 5 soldiers died and 47 were wounded. On October 6, the French army arrived at the Summer Palace outside Beijing. The next day, the British arrived. The Emperor fled Beijing and the Western powers looted the Summer Palace, an act that was shocking and unbelievable for most Chinese. Two weeks later, the British would set fire to the palace as punishment for the Emperor. The Emperor's brother, Prince Gong, negotiated on behalf of Xiang Feng. In addition to the terms of the previous Treaty of Tianjin, China had to open Tianjin as a free trade port, cede Kowloon to Britain, establish freedom of religion, allow British ships to carry indentured Chinese to the Americas, legalize opium trade, and an additional monetary compensation. In addition, Russia permanently gained the maritime provinces, acquiring a total of 1.5 million square kilometers from China. This second defeat was a powerful blow to Chinese influence. Anglo-French forces were outnumbered 10 to 1 and still they were victorious. Emperor Shang Feng fled the capital and the Summer Palace was burned down. China's days as a powerful empire had ended. Now, to put things into perspective, the Opium Wars weren't the only troubles China had to deal with. Between 1840 and 1864, there was also a massive civil war, the Taiping Rebellion, led by a religious lunatic. Hong Xu Quan was trying to become a scholar and official in the civil service. In 1837, he failed examination and returned home feeling sick. He was bedridden for several days, during which he experienced visions. He didn't understand them initially, but six years later he encountered a Protestant Christian missionary, received the pamphlet, and then everything clicked. 
He understood that he was the brother of Jesus Christ and was sent to rid China of the devils. As ridiculous as it sounds, this was no joking matter. He created a movement and started a rebellion that sought to convert China to Christianity, overthrow the Qing dynasty and establish a new state. At one point, they gained control over a large portion of southern China with a population of 30 million and established the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. This civil war led by a deranged religious fanatic was the bloodiest in world history. Over 20 million people died in the conflict. So, from this perspective, the Opium Wars, although humiliating, were not the biggest crisis China went through those years. By the end of the Opium Wars, Chinese scholars and officials realized that the country wasn't facing an age of traditional wars. China was going through an epic crisis. And the troubles didn't end. In 1884, China and France were once more fighting each other and China lost its influence in Vietnam and Indochina. Ten years later, war broke out with Japan and China lost suzerainty in Korea and ceded Taiwan. In 1899, one year after the first Sino-Japanese War, the Boxer Uprising occurred against the increasing influence of Christians and colonialism. Germany, Japan, Russia, Britain, France, the United States, Italy and Austria-Hungary sent 45,000 troops to quell the rebellion. At the same time, Russia invaded Manchuria. Along with other foreign and internal aggressions, these events damaged China beyond repair. Finally, in 1911, revolts broke out throughout the entire country against the monarchy. The Xinhai Revolution led to the abdication of the last emperor of China, Xuantong, and the establishment of the Republic of China, thus ending four millennia of dynastic rule. Of course, we now know that this still wasn't the end. Both Japan and the Soviet Union further invaded China, engulfing the country in World War II, and after that, communist revolutionaries would take over, thus beginning a new, equally as bloody chapter in China's history. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. The link is in the description. I do hope to see you next time. Bye.